Oh, everyone went quiet. <laughs> you thought I was starting, didn't you? Uh, good evening, everyone. October 2021, AEVA monthly hall meeting. Welcome. Thank you for joining. It's a very one-sided uh, gender mix tonight. Jan represent. Okay. Um, any new people here? A couple of new people. All right. Welcome, welcome. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. The toilets are down the corridor there. Um, just flick through, Les. Uh, if you're interested in receiving notifications, you can um, join the Google group uh, for non-members or members. You don't have to be an EV owner or anything like that. And there's the web address for the um, national AVA website, which has got a bunch of EV content on there. We're live streaming, video recording, and these recordings are on my YouTube channel. To if you're ever not at a meeting, you can watch them back. All right, next one, mate. All right, the agenda for tonight. I'm just going to do my normal infrastructure and events updates. And then we're going to hear from Dave from Red Earth Energy Storage. And Diego's brought in his very nice Volvo. He's going to give us a bit of a chat about that. And uh, I'm going to give a bit of a rundown of cars that are very close to coming to the market or we'll be, we'll be seeing next year because I used to probably do that quite frequently and I haven't done it for a little while. And I spent hours doing it today because I kind of lost touch a little bit with the models that are coming and there is quite a lot. So um, I've tried my best to do a lot of the, the mainstream vehicles that we'll probably see rather than some of the specialty vehicles. So, all right, let's kick it off. Recently held EV events. So some of you may know we held the EV experience. I think just about everyone was there mostly. Um, but just for people that aren't or didn't attend or are new or on the live stream, then we'll just run through a few things. So I think firstly, it was very successful. It seems very, um, I, I didn't hear a single bad thing actually in any feedback. Um, everyone said fantastic job. Um, everyone had a good time that I could see and we had 78 battery electric vehicles and three FEBs and I'm sure that must be pretty close to the record for an event in Australia so I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know if there's any other documented, documented uh, uh, occurrence but um, yeah just flick through some of the photos Les and I'll, I'll run through them. So this is actually one half of the amount and this is pretty much the other half so a lot I think the only models that we didn't have there were probably the the Mercedes EQC I think that was the only EV that I don't think I I'm not really I had a bit of a think about it um, some of these are just uh, just go back one step um, this was <laughs> This is one of the stall holders cars, actually the Jaguar I-Pace. This is one of the top models and nearing 200,000 and he was telling us a story how he, how he had it on the beach at Bribey um, the week before. Uh, <laughs> it's got suspension that lifts right up and he said he could just, um, I'm assuming it's multi-motor so he can just all wheel drive it. So that was crazy because I think my wife freaks out when we want to take our $40,000 four wheel drive on the, on the beach, let alone a $200,000 car, but um, the, the other reason this is a good photo is um, some people may not have known, but there's actually a third Imiev in the family to the, the uh, patch, whatever it's called, the regular Imiev, <laughs> sedan, sedan, yeah, and then the mini cab, yeah, and then there's actually a ute, so they're actually called the triplets, um, it's something I learnt beforehand, so Yes, that was good to see there as well. 
So I think there are electric utes available. Electric utes, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, now, this guy, uh, Rob, I think his name is, um, actually bought his family a whole bunch of the vans. That had, they've got about six of them on the bayside, and they just all run around and they play go kart races on the road or something. I don't know. Sound, sounds like a bunch of fun, but so, uh, yeah. I think next up we've got the Porsche Taycan. Amazing vehicle. And I, uh, a few select lucky people got to go in them. And I was one of those and it was insane. Um, the launch from zero, uh, absolutely insane. So I'm sure something actually happened to my brain when we did the launch, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the Tesla guys are a bit more used to that type of stuff where it's, they've got a bit harder launch and more power, but, um, it is, <laughs> like, Fake it, engine noise. I think, um, do you know, I, I drove, the, when I actually, I'm, I'm sure that car probably does, but when I drove the I-Pace, it actually had the same thing. And you can, inside, oh, on the outside, on the outside, yeah. Like in, for, the, for the pedestrian noise, it's got a fake noise, yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't notice that. I was too busy um, collecting my thoughts. Um, all right, what have we got next? Uh, the Audi e-tron, that was there. Uh, so that was pretty, that's a pretty new model. The Hyundai Nexo, the hydrogen vehicle was there. And that took a few people for test rides as well. Uh, these are just some shots of the test ride area. So we had um, about 12 to 15 people volunteered just to come and keep picking people up and whisking them away on the sort of uh, 10 minute trip. So uh, some people thankfully spent their whole time or the whole four hours of the event or just, I think we planned to do the test rides for about three and a half hours just so that there was a bit of a, you know, people weren't rushing at the last minute to get in. But some people just did the test rides the whole event, so um, really appreciative of, of their help in that one. Um, there's a couple more photos of the same thing. There's Francisco's car. Uh, yep, there's Les helping out. Yeah, it ran really well. 150 test rides. Now, I think that's probably a record as well for, like, I helped at Sydney in the test rides uh, at the EV Expo and the, there, were, there were two two hour sessions I think but I'd be surprised if they did 150 because yeah it just wasn't as well, I, it's not that it wasn't well organised it just wasn't, it was just kind of rock up and hop in a car whereas we had more of a schedule so uh, yeah just here's a high shot um, of the stall area and um, just give you an idea of how many people are there. Just flick through, Les. Just some of these stalls have EV and uh, ACF and Solar Citizens and re Regen uh, Charge installing. And uh, even Tesla had a couple of cars there. And uh, Betts Boats, the EV Hub, UV Power. I can't remember their name, um, but they were a subscription service for charging your car. So you could pay them a subscription fee and I think use any, any charges, something along those lines. So I have to get onto them about that and ask them how that works, but. <laughs> okay, we'll have a look in Clean Tech, Clean Technica, yeah. The reason why I put the MG on here is because these guys were selling the MG for 42,000 at the show. So I thought people would want to know that because that's like they came out at 47, 46,990, something like that. But essentially they were, they had 30 in stock as well. So they weren't just like selling them. They had 30 and they were selling them for 42 grand. So that's, that's very cheap, really, for an EV. So, 
Yeah, we had the uh, Team Arrow team there as well. I had the solar car. Yep, a lot of these guys have come to the meeting, so you guys are pretty familiar with it, but um, EV Automotive, automotive um, had their van when that was set out like a camping setup, so I think that was pretty popular. And bikes, that, that were good. That, um, that top one um, got a lot of use out on the field, which wasn't our planned route or anything like that, but uh, anyway. We got next the Transdev bus. Now I, <laughs> I thought that was pretty mean setup, so I thought I'd put that photo in there. But there was tons and tons of um, fire suppressant all through there. They must be worried about battery fires. So um, okay, just a few other bits and pieces. We had. Um, this didn't mean to come out like the Power Rangers, but um, oh, sorry about that. But um, we had a, a few uh, conversions there. A lot of you would be familiar with those ones. And then these are the, we had the Audi E3, A3 e-tron. Um, I hadn't really seen one of those before. I hadn't really seen the um, BMW either. And most people are familiar with the Holden Bolt. So there are a couple of good in inclusions. Uh, there was a strong message put on about, uh, from this photo and the next one, Les, about the fact that uh, EVs can tow. And uh, I thought we, yeah, it was, it was a good message, I think, that stopped putting us in a box and saying that we can't do stuff. So that was the EV experience, um, really good. and. I thank everyone that was involved. Yeah, it was everyone put a lot of work into that, and it came off really well. And the weather held out, so it was a great day. Um, the Toka guys, they did a charity event out at Lakeside um, to race around the track and be the most similar time for each lap. Was the was the test that they had to do. So the regularity challenge. So get the same time each lap. So uh, I didn't get to speak to Luke too much about that, but um, that was a paid event, so I didn't have as, as much attendance, but from all accounts, it was uh, good fun. Then uh, we had the Hamilton EV catch-up, which um, now, I went to Hamilton a lot about two years ago, and I hadn't been in a little while, and they are starting to redevelop the road that this is on. All of this in here, which I didn't realize was happening because of the um, Olympics, actually. It's starting early. So apparently this, this area behind here is gonna be the Olympic Village. Um, so it's nice and handy to the Eat Street markets, I guess, but... Um, the other thing was essentially the East Street markets were on for the first time in a very long time. So there were thousands of people there when we were just trying to steal a bit of empty car space, car park. But um, we got over 20 EVs, which is good, but um, there was a lot of people right. That, it's a humongous, I don't know if anyone's been there, but it's a humongous car park and there were cars all the way up to the Charger, which is right in the back corner. So, but we had fun anyway. What's the next one? Just, um, you know, talking around like that. So, and there was the NV200 there. Don't see too many of those. All right, future events. Okay, I've, I've done a little planning and um, I'll get to that in a moment, but a big one that's coming up at Bracken Ridge on the 31st of October, which is only um, just under two weeks away. Um, we're doing a, like a mini uh, EV experience down at Bracken Ridge Tavern. So there should be um, 20 to 30 EVs there if you want to come along and join in. And they're going to have bikes and stuff like that as well. But that's um, going to be run by ACF and I'm giving them a hand just to um, get people interested. So. Um, 
I've got the details on the next couple of slides, but the next uh, EV catch-up will be up at Maroochydore. I've created the Facebook event for that. Let me know if you're interested and I can send you a link. Um, Pete, I did mention this maybe for the last two months about the Warwick solar farm. And I made the phone call today and we're booked in tentatively at their end, but not tentatively from me because that's the day I want it. Um, the 13th of November, it's a Saturday. And um, I've created a, a Facebook event for that as well. Now, something different with this event is that because it's at Warwick, I'm going to try to have people, maybe I'll get some organisers to help me, but I'll, I'm going to start at Turnbull. We're going to have a group start at Springwood uh, IKEA or Logan IKEA, and then maybe we're going to have a group start at Toowoomba as well. And we'll aim to be there for between 9.30 and 10. And it's uh, the guy that's um, doing the open day. You get to see the mechanisms for the tilting panels and we're going to be right there in the farm, so in the solar farm. So it's going to be pretty interesting. And people are already bugging me about going, so like organising it. So I'm sure it's going to be pretty interesting. However, it's just flick to, we'll just flick through so that's the um, ACF event, 31st of October, 8.30 to 10.30. Mostly about transport. Um, I've learnt this lesson a few times now and this is, I'm gonna do something about it. This is where we're having the EV catch up, right, right there, okay, in, near the Super Cheap um, or Amart in Maroochydore. Some people tend to get lost when I just say in the car park, so. Right, uh, the Warwick Open Day. So it's 161 way for both, whether you're leaving Turnbull or Springwood, and obviously less for Toowoomba. Um, but let's, I know it's a, an early start, but I think it's gonna be pretty worthwhile. So what I'll also like to do is, if people have long range EVs and are planning to go, and the, maybe we could work it, maybe get a list of people that don't mind a passenger that people want to go and people aren't trying to do 14 leaf charges to get out there and back. It's doable. doable. Les said it's doable. Okay. Gordon, he's talking to you, mate. <laughs> nah. Yeah. Now, the guy also said he would make sure the infrastructure out at Warwick was, char was working 100%. 100%. He promised me. Well, I don't have it in writing, but. Okay, look, there hasn't been any notable updates. So for months and months, every month I could give you an update on uh, different charges getting installed, but unfortunately it um, hasn't been too much lately. It's the same, it's the same uh, news that we've had for a couple of months, so I won't dwell on this, but these are the charges coming in the next two years and you can see that is on top of what we already have, so really good. Can I ask you about your thoughts about that? Because all the charges are around the panels and not in between panels. Yeah, I don't like it. I think, I think it's going too much towards the petrol model and that it's a misunderstanding to some degree about how people charge their EV. Like, I don't, I use the, I'm happy to drive, okay, obviously I'd be more happy if there was a charger only five minutes around the corner from my house, but I'm happy to drive 10 minutes to a charger. If I, because I primarily charge off my solar, I primarily charge at home. So if there is a, a period of, six days of cloudiness or I'm at work during the day too much, then occasionally I'll go to, a, to the North Lakes um, Ikea and, and go for lunch and I'll just charge up. But, and I think there is a portion of that that should be allocated for in thinking about the whole 
charging ecosystem, if that's the best word. But primarily, people are charging at home. So I looked at these charges out west, and yes. some stretches you said. <laughs> yeah, I pointed that out on the first yeah, night. Yeah, just too far. Yeah, that gap there. Yeah. Yeah, up there. Yeah. But what this doesn't take into account is like caravan sites where you can stay overnight and um, leave it 100% the next day. So these are just DC fast chargers. Okay. But um, yeah, look, you can't really complain as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, you got to be very careful about saying, no, stop putting charges in. Like, put them everywhere, but understand how they're getting utilised and that um, perhaps fewer sites with more charges would be better than more sites with only one charger. I don't know. But I'll leave that to, I'll leave that to the, the powers that be. John, this is, this is leverage money. So it's not just a rate of hand there with cash. So Amphol are doing it. Going into service stations. Like service stations. Yes. Look, service stations aren't the worst idea because they've got other things there. Like, if you just want to blow, put, put air in your tyres, or wash your windscreen, or buy a Snickers bar, or something like that. Like, it's not the worst idea because the charges sites that I've been at, especially the Quest ones, the, there's nothing. Like, they're not 24 hours a day. They're just under a light on the street somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't think we should be, we shouldn't be mocking anything that's coming. We should just embrace it, I guess. But it just gives me the impression that um, perhaps they're still thinking of the petrol model. That's all. And I'm, I reckon they'll fill in some of those gaps. Hopefully, let's let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, let's move on to our speakers for the night. Dave from, you ready to go, mate? Yep. Red Earth Solutions. Red Earth. Yep. Okay. Thanks, John. Hey, folks. Um, my name is Dave Nolan. I'm from Red Earth Energy Storage. Have any of you heard of us? Yep. A few of you. Very good. Sorry. Brisbane, yeah. So um, we're an Aussie-made, Aussie-owned company. As you can probably tell, I'm neither of those. But um, well, you could say I'm Aussie-owned at the moment, seeing as I can't leave. But um, we're based in Dara, so we're Brisbane-based. And basically, what we do is we're a manufacturer of. Am I? Am I gone? All right. Yeah. Will I just keep going? Or? I'll give them a minute. Can you hear me? There we go. So um, basically what we do is we manufacture battery energy storage systems, or BESS. So utilizing your solar that you have existing uh, to collect that excess during the day, store it into a battery, and then use that at night time for your EV, your home, whatever it is that you, you use your electricity consumption. Um, so we were founded in 2013 by two, our two main founders, uh, Chris uh, Winter and Charles Walker. So uh, Chris actually has a bit of a reputation in the battery world. He founded a company here in Brisbane as well called Redflow, if any of you are familiar with the zinc bromide technology. Um, so he started that with his butter and he exited Redflow. It never got to the stage of where it was uh, as scalable as lithium is now. Um, but basically they set out to be more customer centric in uh, Red Earth to have a product that actually uh, serves you as a customer. So what we do is we, we have what we call electricity 2.0 and I'll go into a, a bit more detail about that. So if you can flick through. So this is just to give you an idea of the range that we manufacture. That's not our comprehensive range. That's more so our smaller side of the stuff. Uh, the first one here is what, what we call the vault. Then we have our, it's actually a lead acid replacement. The next one is our Black Max. That's actually our, our little baby off-grid system. 
So dedicated off-grid homes, uh, small weekender sheds, stuff like that. Then we have our Grid Connect Sunrise. Uh, we have that in a range of single phase and three phase. Uh, then we have our dedicated off-grid honey badger and our range topping drop bear, as we call it. So we've had some uh, clever names that, uh, creative names, you could say, uh, that are kind of Aussie related. Uh, so the next slide is our battery. So we have uh, the Red Earth Tropo is a 4.1 kilowatt hour battery that we actually manufacture here in Brisbane. Uh, so it's the only and first CEC approved Australian made LFP battery. So if any of you are familiar with the solar industry, you'll know that the CEC is the Clean Energy Council, who uh, is the governing body of, of solar and what happens in the industry. So we've got a, approved on that. Uh, it's a 48 volt uh, battery. Um, it does have some added extras like the carry handle, which wasn't in the industry before that, and also our on-screen on, uh, on display or odometer, which allows you to see what's actually happening on each battery. And that comes with a 10-year warranty then as well. So the next slide is the vault. So that's kind of more so for off-grid lead acid properties. Um, basically, we use our Tropo battery and replace lead acid systems or our batteries, which are uh, no longer usable or fading away. Um, the next one is our Baby Black Max that I mentioned. So it's a little five kilowatt system, can house up to three of the batteries. So any of you ha who have sheds or weekenders that um, are not connected to the grid or you wanted to step off the grid, uh, that might be suitable for that. The, the next one then is probably more related to everyone here. Uh, or is there anyone here who's actually off grid? No. Yeah, okay, yeah. And um, so this one is probably more relevant for everyone here. It's our sunrise range. So we have the two on the left are the single phase. One is just a smaller version of the other for smaller consumption homes. Uh, generally speaking, if you have an EV, you're probably looking at the maxi version, which is on top. And then the one here on the right is a three phase version. So uh, basically what our best is is you can use it to just collect excess solar that you have in your, your, from your solar right now and put it into a battery, as I said. Um, or you can actually add more solar directly connected to our system. So there's a couple of options with what we can actually do. Um, the single phase is a five kilowatt system. So most people are familiar with 6.6 .6 kilowatts of solar. So that's what goes on to that if you want to add more solar. Uh, the idea is that if you have enough excess solar now, we can just collect it. But as we all know, most of our, our electricity consumption is, is just constantly climbing with, with new appliances, uh, more smarts, um, even though some of them are getting more efficient, uh, then we do have electric vehicles coming on board. So uh, the three phase system is a 10 kilowatt system, so twice as big, uh, twice as powerful. Uh, it also gives you some blackout protection as well. So if you do want to keep the, obviously the fridges and the lights running and essentials like that, we can do that. Uh, it comes with a 10 year warranty and 4G monitoring as well. Uh, but also what you'll see here at the bottom is part of our electricity 2.0 is what we call a, a personal power plant. So I don't know if any of you here are familiar with a VPP or a virtual power plant. Yeah. Um, Chris, our founder, actually calls the VPP the arch nemesis and our PPP is the Rebel Alliance because basically the concept of VPP is that they give you, you know, $200 a year and they say, thank you very much, we're going to use your battery whenever we please. So they'll drain your battery based on the market price, they'll diminish your battery when the price is high and they'll get maximum value out of your battery. So the idea is that as part of our PPP service, we're going to turn the electricity market on its head a bit. So um, I'll explain that a bit more. Uh, the next slide is just, again, is our off-grid system. Um, we cut a bit like a fridge freezer. Uh, this one is dedicated off-grid, not really suitable for homes who are connected. The next one is the drop bear. So this one is actually both. It can do on-grid and off-grid. So if any of you actually are dedicated to 
jumping off the grid and still want to have the ability to charge your electric vehicles, etc. This is this is the system that we have. Um, you can start off on grid and someday you can go out and cut the wires, but obviously make sure everything's turned off. Um, so it houses up to about almost 60 kilowatt hours of battery storage. So it's it's quite a hefty bank, uh, depending on what your daily consumption looks like. Um, with the average home about 20 kilowatt hours a day, it's it's you know it's quite hefty. Um, beyond that, then we have, which is a larger version, a more of a utility scale version, or if you want to have more storage, uh, the Copperhead goes up to. Uh, it's actually up to 135 kilowatt hours, so much more expandable uh, and much more powerful as well. It comes in single and three phase as well. Um, it is also on and off grid, so you have the choice again, or depending on the scenario. After that then, we have larger off, uh, commercial and industrial uh, products, uh, which we call the, the Kookaburra and uh, just the next slide there, the Kookaburra and the Bush Pig. If anyone look, is looking for a Bush Pig, I can sort you out. You can come to me after. Um, and the Cassowary. Uh, so after that then we have our monitoring. So this is where we start moving into Electricity 2.0. So what we do is all of our systems, including off-grid systems, we have the ability to actually monitor their performance, see what they're doing, what they're generating, what people are using, uh, when they're using it. Um, so as you can see here, it gives you a breakdown of what, where the power and energy is coming from uh, and being able to quantify that on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly and annual basis. Uh, and we do that through our 4G facility. If 4G is not available, we use your, your local Wi-Fi if you have Wi-Fi, etc. cetera. Um, and using that allows us, it gives us a lot of data. And obviously data is, is valuable these days. So, uh, that brings us on to our PPP service. So if you, just on the next slide, is that what we call Electricity 2.0, and as I mentioned, the VPP um, is a virtual power plant. Um, so ours is a personal power plant. And the reason that we are, are doing it is because we, we see a gap in the market where VPP is just taking advantage of you, as most power companies do. And we actually want to give the power back to you to have the discretion to say, well, I don't want to trade my battery power today or tomorrow. I want to keep it because I know there's a storm coming, etc. Uh, and you have that discretion. Um, and you have the discretion to say, well, I don't want to sell my power unless I get X price. So that's the way the electricity market is heading. It's, it's not so much now as a, a one-way wire coming from a power station. Now it's more so about self-generation and actually sending it back up the wire to your neighbor or whoever it is, whoever needs that power that you don't need. So what we do is, on the wholesale market, if anyone's here familiar with the electricity market, typically it goes up and down like a stock market all day. Um, there is averages, of course, and, and historical prices that we can have a look at, but to give you an idea of what we do, what we do there's, throughout the day, there's typically two spikes. Uh, one in the morning when we all get up and we switch everything on, uh, suddenly there's a, a surge in demand and that's when the price goes up on the market as well. We don't see that, we just get charged a flat fee. Uh, typically, so if, if you think of the price spiking like this, uh, typically what you will see is that we pay this flat fee and we don't see that, that price increase. We just go on, go on about our day and, and that's it. Um, what happens then during the day is when everyone's solar is online, um, you'll see the price actually falling. And sometimes it gets to zero, and sometimes it actually gets to negative. So that doesn't make a lot of sense financially for, let's say, a, a solar farm who has uh, invested in a solar farm in order to actually make money. When the price goes negative, it's actually costing them money to put their power onto the grid. So the idea is that the electricity market is heading in a way that we want people to get batteries to absorb that. So. What we, were, what we will aim to do with our PPP service is that when the price is negative, we'll have a couple of smarts in your home where we can actually charge the car, turn on the aircon, charge your batteries for tonight, and you're getting paid to do so, so it makes sense financially. And you're absorbing that excess and helping stabilize the grid as well. So to give you an idea of 
what you can actually access through the PPP is we're all familiar with a, a feed-in tariff. I'm sure if anyone here has solar, we're familiar with that seven to 11 cents that we get from the electricity retailers. Uh, and of course they're falling and, and people don't like that, but I'm afraid that's just a reality as I mentioned with the zero and negative pricing. So every time they give you 10 or 15 cents, when they actually could have bought it on the market for close to zero, well then they're obviously making a loss and it's more so a marketing thing to keep you on board as a customer. So to give you an idea of what you can access through the electricity market is that the price can actually get to $15 per kilowatt hour, okay? So you have access to that if you're on the wholesale market pricing. Um, and I don't know if any of you are familiar, but a couple of months ago we had an explosion in a uh, power plant in Khalid up in northern Queensland, and that had a dramatic effect because obviously it's a, it's a catastrophic event. So the grid becomes under severe strain to maintain power for all around the grid, and we had multiple blackouts, etc. So what happens is the price spiked immediately to that maximum capping, which is $15 per kilowatt hour, uh, or $15,000 per megawatt hour. And basically, if you had a battery system, and you had a full battery system, what you would do is you would send it back to the grid and get as close as possible to that high price. Now, that's an outlier moment. You're not going to get that every day. But to give you an idea of what may happen, is during a day when the solar is, is, there's lots of solar online, you may be able to charge your batteries for eight cents per kilowatt hour. If you have 10 kilowatt hours, it'll cost you 80 cents to fill up. And let's say you have a dramatic effect or a moment where there's a catastrophic event and you sell for $10 per kilowatt hour, well, suddenly you've got $100. Okay, so this is not, it's not gonna happen every day, but it'll give you an idea of the, the mismatch between pricing that you will have access to through having a battery system and absorbing that excess. Um, so yeah, to give you an idea, uh, our founder Chris actually has the three phase sunrise uh, with just batteries. His roof is not very suitable for solar, he has a lot of shade. So what he did during this is we, we use it as a trial uh, for R&D purposes to actually charge from the grid when the price is low and then discharge when the price is high. So during this event, uh, he was on the phone to his wife and he told her to turn everything off so that he could sell the power back to the grid at $15 per kilowatt hour. So he had a base load of about 600 watts and he has a three phase system that can punch 10 kilowatts back to the grid. So it was discharging at 9.4 kilowatt per hour, okay? So if you look at this event, if that price stayed at $15 for that, for that full hour, he nearly has 10 kilowatt hours gone back to the grid. So he's made $150 in an hour. Um, these, as I said, is an outlier moment, but overall, over the last couple of months, he's actually went from a, uh, I think it was $300 per month bill to income of about $120 from no solar and just charging from the right time at the grid and discharging when the price is high. And he's actually been quite lax at that. So he, he's, he gets a notification on his phone and he has to go in and he has to tell it to discharge now uh, for the next 20 minutes or half an hour, or whatever it is. And then he has to tell it when to charge. So the idea is that we're going to automate that. And we're working on an app at the moment, uh, which is in trial stage of, at the moment as well. And basically what that will do is it'll have algorithms where it will recognize what's happening in the market and make a decision in your battery system for you. And that's where I said that you'll get the chance to actually set your parameters that I don't want to sell unless it's at X price. So will you be charging the system on off peak? Can you do that? Uh, basically, when you move to the electricity wholesale market, you don't really have an off peak. It'll okay. be whatever the market price is. Yeah. yeah. Okay which will vary throughout the day, but typically what he'll do, he, you have two, two opportunities really. Uh, at night time you have the base load which is run by power plants, etc., and that can be quite cheap because they know uh, it's quite predictable what's gonna happen. Yeah. So that price is quite low. So he can technically charge when that happens yeah. during the night and then discharge during the peak when we all get up in the morning and, and make some money there. Yeah. 
or if he has a big enough battery system, he'll be able to ride the whole night on his battery system yeah, yeah. and still discharge in the morning and make yeah. profit from that. Uh, and then during the day, if he doesn't have solar, which he doesn't at the moment, yeah. uh, you will, or normally what would happen is the, the solar will charge the batteries yeah. once uh, as, uh, instead of exporting, it will charge the batteries. And then you have the opportunity to discharge again when that peak in the afternoon comes. So you would also possibly charge through the day when the solar price would drop the wholesale price down, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's currently what he does. Yeah. Um, and he does have to do that every day, yeah. regardless of what the price is, because he doesn't have solar. And he's, right. So he has, the op he has the decision to either pay the market price and not charge batteries, uh, but then he, he opens himself to that, that afternoon peak where he has no battery power to ride the wave, as we call it. So he has to actually pay whatever the price is. So it often makes more financial sense for him to charge at least enough to get through the peak in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, anything beyond that then is just pure profit if he wants to actually try and make money from it. So that's what we're trialing is, is the automation part. Right now it's, it's a bit, it's a bit Manual, as I said, you have to go in and tell it, okay, charge now, discharge now. So we're automating that. What's the average peak market price, roughly? Um, off the top of my head, I actually don't know what the, the peak price is, but uh, I think he has been selling for around that 20 cents kind of range. You, you'll buy, so you'll buy for anywhere from 15 to 20 cents, uh, typically. Um, and then your discharge is, is going to be lower. But the idea is that it's not as easy as just collecting uh, or, or selling from your battery system because what will happen is, unfortunately, the rea reality is that your solar feed-in price will eventually get to zero because there'll be so much solar online that it has nowhere to go. And if there's not enough batteries to soak it up, well, then the price is going to be always so low. So we actually need to have control over your system to say, okay, you have excess solar, your batteries are full, but we can't send it back to the grid because we're going to get charged if we send it back to the grid. So we'll actually wind the solar down um, and, and shut it down. And then should you need to, you can start it back up again if it's still sunny. Um, so that's kind of the way that the market is working, if that makes sense. Um, Beyond that, then, we are looking at other ways of actually making money with your battery system. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but basically, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with cryptocurrencies. So uh, digital currencies like cryptocurrencies are typically mined, and they use a lot of, of energy. So uh, if you're familiar with them, you'll have noticed that Elon Musk came out and said that cryptocurrencies are quite bad because they use a lot of energy, which they do. So that, of course, resulted in the price to fall off a cliff edge. Um, but the idea is that we have thousands of systems out in the field. So we were like, well, why can't we make green crypto? So now we're moving, to the, moving over as well that instead of sending it back to the grid for that 7 or 11 cents, or in the event of when the price, if you're on the market price, it's quite low, that we'll actually divert that power to a crypto miner and start mining cryptos. Okay, and that can often return about a dollar or a dollar twenty per kilowatt hour. So, very lucrative as well, um, and that's stuff that we're working on in the background as well now at the moment. So, rather than a, looking at a battery and solar to squash the bill and, and save you money, it's typically only about thirty percent of the value of a battery. The rest of the value of the battery is actually making you money if you actually time your use and, and uh, all of your, your inputs and outputs it correctly. So is Red Earth going to become an energy retailer also at the same time? So rather than all our customers, say if I'm a, a customer doing a bunch of boss does, having a battery system at home yeah. and being a wholesaler, a private wholesaler, would we become customers of Red Oaks and having a battery system at home and then you make a little bit off the side and we make a bit more on the side? That may be something that's coming in the future. You haven't, you haven't got there yet? Or? Um, we are working on it, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to. When you sell electricity, then you have to be a retailer? Yes, you do, yeah. 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 So 
is your boss a retailer, but he's going to one customer here. Uh, no, right now you can actually do it through a company called Amber Energy, Amber Electric. So basically, if you live in an eligible postcode, uh, which is most of, most of Energex's uh, postcodes, you can actually access the wholesale market. But it wouldn't be a clever thing to do unless you have batteries, because if it's just solar, you expose yourselves to those peaks that I mentioned, which is typically when solar is not online. Yeah, and then you would be paying to Yes, at certain times you'd be paying yeah. to export. Yeah. Do yeah. we have any other questions? On that side of the No. No? Oh. All right. Okay, well, I have got 30. Yeah. I really just wanted to throw it. You talked about the sort of online system, either the mini or the maxi, which is kind of, you know, the home system single-post. Yeah. Uh, in yeah, you're correct. In the mini, it's about 12.3 kilowatt hours. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Uh, we are a little bit more expensive. Uh, we're obviously Australian made. So, um, how much? Uh, off the top of my head, we actually have an offer at the moment on the the 12 kilowatt hour for it's 13.990 plus install. Yeah. yeah. Plus install. Yeah. So that's not that much different. Stats. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, but then the maxi, so the maxi can actually go double that. So yeah. Yeah. All our systems are modular, so you don't have to jump into the deep end. We can start off small and go from there. Good question. I think LG Chem is about 10,000 10, for a 10 kilowatt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, the only difference is, like, let's say with the LG Chem, it is just a battery, yeah. um, while our system is a BES. So you can actually attach the solar to it, and it has some advantages there. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for going through all that. All right. Um, no problem. We quit. <laughs> yeah. Well, perfect. Thank you very Thanks, much, guys. mate. Uh, next up, we have Diego, um, who's kindly brought in his. How, how long have you had it now, mate? Uh, Must be pretty new. It's pretty clean. 22 days. 22 days. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, it hasn't even. Have you washed it yet? No. Oh. No need. It's no coated. need. It's <laughs> coated. Okay. All right. He's. Um, Kindly brought in his XC40, and he's going to give us uh, a bit of a discussion about why he bought the XC40 and um, just some of the detail about it. So, thank you, mate. So our journey actually lasted roughly 12 years. That was the start when I first saw EVs. That was actually in the States. We lived in Boston, and we saw the expo of the first Nissan Leaf that came to to the States. That was interesting and that piqued my interest then. But it was just something at that time that we couldn't afford. It was too expensive and all of these reasons. It was also the time when Tesla started its journey, the crazy journey they are on, but it's really impressive because it's not that long ago. And um, it was also the time when the Apple iPhone came onto the market. And I'm from Switzerland. And it was very interesting. Everybody in Switzerland, all the friends wanted an Apple iPhone, something new, exciting. So I started some drug trafficking between the states with Apple iPhones. <laughs> um, this is a thank you for reminding me. <laughs> OK. So then uh, we came to Australia. We moved to Australia because of our jobs. My wife got a job as a vet here in Queensland. And uh, at that time, the problem was for us money starting here, everything new. We had to get housing, buying furniture, and all of that. So it was not really possible to buy an EV at the time. But we still wanted to lower our emissions for transport. and the, <clears throat> The choice we went with was a Citroen C4. 
I don't know if you know that model. It's actually amazingly efficient because driving around town here, it's around five liters a hundred k's, but it's pretty impressive because there's possibly no cars around that do that nowadays. And um, with the C4, we did a trip that went out west, Roma, Carnarvon Gorge, Ellie Beach, all that, with three people, every nook was filled, I don't know how we did it at that time, and what we learned is that we actually, that, that a C4 doesn't like the Australian uh, cattle grids. <laughs> <laughs> Then came a kid along and we needed more space, so that was the reason we got a second car, that was a Skoda Octavia. Really large vehicle inside and we're used to that now because we do lots of camping. Everything goes in there, we don't even need a roof box because it's so spacious. And that was something that was, is often a problem in the EV space because lots of them don't have enough space or not that much space. We also looked at the Outlander PHEV at the time, but that was just too expensive. It was 55,000 at the time. And I was just not convinced that it would be the solution. It says on paper that it would use 2.1 liters around the case, but in reality, it would probably be more, especially when you drive further distances out of town. So switching to today, the long story short is actually the Citroen just didn't want to die. That was a problem, so we couldn't get another car because you, like everybody would tell you, it's better to keep an old car that is very efficient than to buy a shiny new EV that is, has lots of resources in it and everything. Uh, but finally in January 2021, my wife said, I have enough. I don't want to drive the Citroen C4 anymore because uh, she was not sure if she could drive down the Gold Coast and back without getting stranded. It had 160,000 Ks on it. And who is arguing with, it, with their wife? So we just said, yes, we get an EV. Also the reason was it really was falling apart. The, the paint was peeling off, the radio was not working, the fuel tank was leaking and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we went on a hunt for a new transport solution. And some, just to give you some background information, what we need in an EV, because that's a very personal thing. My wife commutes to work roughly 12 Ks a day, so not very much. We have one kid, a Chaco Swift camper trailer for camping, a dog, bikes, a kayak that all come with us to camping, so we need something we can tow with, something that is long range, because we go camping along the coast from roughly Bundaberg down to Yamba. So like a short range wouldn't fit us, especially with a trailer, although we haven't tested that yet, so we have to see how that works out. But with the charges coming in on the coast, that shouldn't be a problem actually. And we have a garage for charging, but it's always very nice to have with an EV. And our house is very efficient, so I did lots of work to make our house efficient. It has solar, we use roughly um, six kilowatt hours a day, but it's very low. Not off-grid though, very good on you doing that. And uh, everything else is electric. We have an electric scooter for just short range local trips. And the CO2 emissions in our family are roughly around five and a half tons, and that's with the um, ICE cars. So what we hope to do with this car now is that we can also slash the emissions from transport. But just to be uh, coming from Switzerland, you know, you go back, you fly to Switzerland, lots of miles in the plane, and basically, you can say flying is wrecking everything. You can do everything you want to do with CO2 emissions. You fly once and then you have to wait five years. Your emissions are done. It's just crazy. And it's not easy with having family back in Switzerland, so that's a problem for us, actually. And that's not even counting all the emissions from stuff, you know, furniture, 
whatever, toys for our kids. So buying an EV and being able to tow a camper trailer, what we plan to do is having short charging sessions, the fast charger. That's the reason that, that we chose a vehicle that has a high charging rate. So this vehicle has 150 k kilowatts. And then they're just charging at the campground to 100%. So this would make it, make it really easy to travel longer distances, then arrive at, this, at the destination and charge it there to the rest. And we want to be nicer to Mother Earth because uh, as everybody in here would be aware, we probably will run into lots of problems in the future because it's just not going to work how we live. And uh, we have to be honest that even how we live is not going to solve the problem because we just use too many resources, energy. Okay, so what's the solution to that? To our background information is do the Aussie thing, a land cruiser with a three-ton caravan, uh, preferably having a PHEV or even better, an electric land cruiser, but that's not on the market. So we had to go with what's on the market. And so basically we looked at all the EVs that are on the market, the Leaf, the MG, the e Nero, the Kona, the Outlander, the EQA, the i the Model 3, XC40. We test off all of them and then compared that to the criteria that we had, that is, it has to have space. The CO2 life cycle has to be good, so that means the Outlander is out of question, basically. Then it has to tow a camper trailer that is, that is 1.5 ton, 1.2 tons, loaded with all the gear that is in there. And the price was a criteria as well. The range, is it fun? And does it have a charge rate that is above 120 kilowatts? So that means basically the Leaf, the MG, the e Nero, and the Kona were all out of, of the race because of space and also because of towing. The Outlander because of the CO2 emissions. The EQA was nice, but the space there was just on the, it's just not enough because it's quite small. The iPace was nice, that was, would actually be a car that we would like, but it's just too expensive because it's basically roughly 130, 140,000, so double decent and you get at the price that you get it. <laughs> no. <laughs> and towing is a problem as well, yes. And with lots of these models, the problem is also, you know, when you ask, can the vehicle tow? They don't know. Do you have a tow bar? I don't know, go to Europe, get one from there, go to the States, get one from there. So you really have to be somebody that likes to tinker and, and go through the hoops and, and get it. And with this model, we basically told them we want the towing kit and they delivered it, they installed it, and we didn't have to worry about it. So that was a plus for us. Also with the Kona and e Nero. The dealers didn't get back to us. You call them, you want an EV, nothing. Really nothing. It's really interesting that these guys are just, and it's, it was also not organized because at the beginning they said, oh, it's a dealership, you have to call there. And then suddenly they said, you have to go to Hyundai, Australia. They took it over. So really it's not, it was not clear where, where you have to go. Uh, we also, of course, thought of the Model Y, the Ionic 5 that just came in into Australia, the Kia EV6, the Audi Q4, and the Enyaq. So these would all be vehicles that would fit our bill. They have the range, they have the price, they have the space. Towing is a problem with some of them. And the one thing is they're not available. So if you have a vehicle that falls apart, what do you do? Do you wait another two years? It's not clear when they come in, so that was the reason also that we said, okay, now we pull the trigger, we go with this. 
So far, the negatives of the XC40 is that it really has, to, has a lower efficiency than a Tesla or a Kona. You look at roughly 150, 160 watt hours a kilometer, and with this one, you're looking at 21, 210 watt hours a kilometer, so quite a bit more. So as you can see, boxy shape, nice looking, but definitely not efficient, but on the other hand, it has quite a big battery, so the range is still there, not like a Tesla, but, you know, I was actually just today charging at home, and then I looked at it, it has 53%, and I just put Byron Bay into the navigation system, and it came up, you arrived there without, with 6% rate, uh, battery left. So basically, you don't have to vary range, Anxiety as uh, no, I know. Yeah, I I know that's what the gasometer is uh, saying. But uh, still, you know, sometimes you have in your head when you buy a vehicle that you think, oh, it's just not enough, and then you go through the maps and look at distances and everything. But in reality, like it, probably many people tell you, it's not that much of a problem. Like my wife just drove to work and back and we drove around for a whole week without charging and still had 39% left, so. Okay, so there will be many more models coming next year, so that's really exciting. And um, <clears throat> before we, bought this vehicle, I asked on Facebook in a EV group, should we wait, should we get this vehicle? And of course, many opinions there. I also mentioned that I don't like the Ionix 5 interior, and somebody told me it's actually nice when you can choose because of looks and design. So there's so many EVs now in the market that it's really easy to choose an EV. So I think EVs have a bright future, and uh, that's great. So thank you very much for listening, and if you want to have a look at the vehicle. Got any questions while we're, while yeah, I guess still up here? It's 80, drive away, and the, the towing kit was another three. With tinting and towing kit and yeah. I three. Oh, let's give a dagger. In your research, did you find a white hand driver in that car? In my research, I, I look. My research consisted of a lot of surfing the internet I must admit right but I don't just look at one website and write it on this thing I try and cross reference it two or three times to see because it's annoying to say that this car is going to be 21,000 which is what one website reports and then you just do some easy math and it like there's a bunch of corrections I've put on here or assumptions about <laughs> Like, there is an 80 kilowatt hour battery coming up or something like that, and they s tell you the consumption, and they tell you it's going to get 590 kilometer range. And you're like, well, but you told me it was going to have like 20 kilowatt hours per hundred. It's got an 80 hour ba kilowatt hour battery. How are you getting 600 kilometers out of that? It just doesn't make sense. So I've tried to be as accurate as possible as always. Um, General referencing was that um, two or three websites said this car was coming to Australia. Okay, so if it doesn't make it, it's not my fault. All right. <laughs> this complete disclaimer. Yes, mate. Next port. So next port, uh, are you saying, Nathan, that next port aren't importing these? I'm saying there's no right-hand drive version of that car anywhere in the world, so until okay. the business company is on the system. They're being made in a Australian section of the weird package, which doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you can take my one dollar.
All right? Well, you can take my $1 bet. My $1 bet. All right? It's a serious bet. You had your chance, all right? <laughs> Is everyone back? Oh, yeah. Let's just move on. Let's move. Now, look, there's a fair few cars. I'm not going to bore you all night with ins and outs of every one. I'm just going to go through some of the specs, all right? Just because it's nice to know stuff about EVs ahead of time. Okay, so if we just go back one moment, mm -hmm. there were websites saying that this. <laughs> yes. So th is this the dolphin? So on um, fully charged, they gave the price, and I did the conversion, and it was twenty-one thousand five hundred. Now it's not going to be that. So you can, you, you can take my money on that, but we'll see. But um, yes, okay. Well, let's say that's a possibility. Let's let's move on to the next ones. But BYD have got a bunch of brands, so a bunch of models. So perhaps this one doesn't make it, but I expect the other ones. This is the power. <laughs> okay. All right. Note to self for November meeting. Completely research the dolphin. Okay. All right. Um, so this 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 range is um, close to coming or coming in 2022. It's not a bit. No. Again, no right hand drive will be made. Okay. We get it. We get it. Okay. What about this one? You got any comment on this one? No right hand drive. No right hand drive. Any BYD with a right hand drive? Nathan? Yeah, E6 and T3. Okay. I've seen that the one that's getting around in Australia, well, let's just move to the next one. You can read on the screen. Right hand drive. It does, because that guy's in, in a right hand drive. Unless someone flipped the image. So, end of next year, 42 grand. So, that is a seven seater, I believe. So, um, maybe a bit bigger than the MG, but the same, similar pricing. Um, larger range, but next one, mate. Now, I've kind of grouped these in by area of manufacture, so we'll kind of stick with the China, then we'll go to Korea, then we'll go to um, Europe. But, okay, let's say some of these are speculative. This one is not confirmed, and um, neither is the next one, the P5, but um, I think there's enough um, interest in cheaper end EVs coming out. So you've got 50 grand and 60 grand. That's not a bad looking thing for 60 grand if it has 400k range. So we've got next. Polestar. Definitely coming January 2022. Okay. This is the Polestar website. Drive away 63,000 to 73,500 for the top model. 72.5 kilowatt hour battery, four to 500 kilometer range, as you can see there. All right, definitely coming out, that one. I probably started this slide with the definitely coming outs and then added a few of the might be coming out. So I apologize for that inconsistency, but um, this is, do you know uh, Peter that does the van, the EC11? This is um, from the same company. This was meant to be out already, but there's delays worldwide with um, vehicle manufacture, so this is sometime in 2022. Next one, thanks, mate. And thank you, Nathan. Model Y, quarter two. 2022? Maybe earlier. Maybe earlier? Okay. No, 
Toronto is never on in Toronto. <laughs> Anywhere in the world. All right. <laughs> Um, 70 to 100, 440 to 540 estimated range. Bit more expensive than the standard, uh, than the Model 3 options. Uh, the Neo ES8 coming in 2022, 90 grand, 400 kilometer range. Now, the more I do this, the more I see 400 kilometers range because I don't think they know how to tell you how much a range a car has based on their consumption and all that type of thing. But it just seems consistently that it's 400 kilometer range. So it looks pretty big, actually, that thing. All right, so early 2022, if you were one of the 240 people who got an order, uh, 75 to 80 grand. It is a pretty decent car and it's got a lot going for it so it'll be very interesting to see when it hits the market um, if people if it lives up to a lot of the hype because um, I think we were talking just at, before the um, the video started that yeah he under had 10,000 inquiries and only had 240 you know available so Bit of an indictment on the Australian market at the moment that we're just not serious about EVs and that's unfortunate. So the EV6, the basically the sister car of the Ionic 5, uh, pretty very very similar stats, but coming late 2022, early 2023. That's what I have um, noted. Now I think this is essentially the premium brand of Hyundai, Genesis. This is the GV60, and I saw this and I thought, oh, well, that's really just uh, expensive Kona. So, um, yeah, we, we'll, I'll give you more detail on that, but that's so time in 2022. Um, right, we'll move on to, the, so that was Koreans, and these are some of the German cars. Understand... Um, We've gone up in price a fair bit, but 115,000 for this one. Uh, likely to be out before the end of 2021. 130? Okay, well I checked and if they say 110, I make it 115. So, 128? Okay, is it already out? You can order it, yeah, okay. There's a couple in Australia. Is it like the test ones or? Yeah, okay. Uh, the i4. Now, <laughs> sorry for bringing maths into the equation, all right? But this, <laughs> so 84 kilowatt hour battery 16 to 20 kilowatt hours per 100 is roughly 18. That gives a range of 466 kilometers, not 590 kilometers. So, sorry, I'm just gonna point out, you have to take everything that's said with a grain of salt. So, 140,000 for the Mercedes. Is, that can't be right if the last one was 140 or 130. Think that's about right? Okay. I actually, when I first saw this one, thought it was quite a nice looking car. Um, very aerodynamic, but out of most people's price range, 500 kilometer range. I think this was given a lot bigger than 500 kilometer range, like over 600, but I disagree. And the Audi e-tron GT, Another very nice car, more than 170,000 and 400 kilometer range. So I think that's about it. Um, what other cars can you think of? The Alperia, Al Atira. Yeah, I didn't put that on there. Is that known what date that's coming out? Um, well, You've ordered one, haven't you? I've ordered one. It says uh, 2022. 2022. Oh, that should have been all good. All right, let's break and um, have a chat.
and have a look, closer look at this Volvo. And thanks very much.